Welcome to the third dialogue series on enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response to build back better in recovery, rehabilitation and reconstruction. We will begin our program with a cut and razor, a video about this particularly important topic. The video will be followed by the opening remarks from the country director of Invest in Africa, Ms. Wangeshi Murioki. Thereafter, our third dialogue series will be launched with a keynote address from Honorable Rachel Shebesh, Chief Administrative Secretary, Ministry of Public Service and Gender. Honorable Rachel Shebesh is also the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Champion and the former chair of the African Parliamentarian Initiative for Climate Risk Reduction. Thereafter, we will have a 20-minute panel discussion. We all agree that where we are at today with the COVID-19 pandemic, extreme weather events and other disasters, we need innovative and practical solutions. Therefore, our panelists today will enrich the dialogue by sharing their best practices, insights and experience that will move us towards actions and commitments for instituting and mainstreaming SME disaster resilience. Without further ado, IIA and its partners presents the Road to Resilience. Globally, quick and slow onset disasters are increasing in number and in intensity. Disasters overwhelm the capacity of individuals and organizations to mitigate, prepare, respond and recover from impact. Unfortunately, many small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, especially in developing countries, are extremely vulnerable to disasters as a result of a predominant focus towards short-term business survival. So my name is Wangeshi Murioki. I am the country director of uh, Invest in Africa, Kenya. Invest in Africa conducted a study in 2019 on SMEs to understand the level of prioritization of uh, risk management in these uh, businesses that uh, form a very important constituent of uh, our economy. And uh, the study findings revealed quite a number of resilience concerns, but uh, what was more appalling was the level of uh, preparedness, the lack of business continuity plans, lack of understanding on uh, succession planning, among other areas that uh, would point to the levels of understanding on risk management. And uh, this just went on to reveal that most SMEs in Kenya and in Africa do not really understand risk management. So my name is Mudon Njogu and I'm a social entrepreneur with a passion for empowering the youth, the community and SMEs. Um, the period following the COVID-19 pandemic saw a rise in discussions and actions around building back better. Uh, building back better is really demonstrating the importance of early warning systems in preparedness. Um, early warning is a critical element of disaster risk reduction and to be effective it must be inclusive to ensure a constant state of preparedness, uh, facilitate public education and dissemination of messages and warnings. Uh, building back better is also about assessing the operational and human capacities, uh, identifying who does what where in the public and in the private sector. And it is really about formulating risk-informed emergency response, contingency and business continuity plans. And for example, we have, have, we have an emphasis on addressing health risks because of COVID-19. However, business continuity plans should seek to address environmental, technological, biological hazards and risks. Um, and all this, there has to be some capacity building, building around communicating 
educating and training all stakeholders. Building back better should also trigger planning, planning for external assistance. And in our particular case, planning at the ward level, at the county level, at the national level, and even move on to the regional and international level. It also means preparing to make funding and alternate relief arrangements. For example, we saw the release of the stimulus packages. Building Back Better calls for, en for engagement with science, universities and learning institutions to manage knowledge and promote public awareness on issues of disaster risk preparedness. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Joki Morumba, and uh, I come to you in, um, as a faculty member both at the uh, Strathmore Business School. I also do have um, a, a position at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and the field in which um, I have studied and in, in the field in which I do research and, and teach um, is the field of uh, disaster management. And um, I am happy to be here in my in in my capacity as someone who is involved in academia to really reiterate that uh, there is a place for academia um, when it comes to building risk resilience amongst SMEs. The reason being that um, um, academia does have a way in which it, it's able to, to help and uh, uh, you know decipher and understand and, and come together around uh, the reality that disasters are not ex entirely unprecedented. Or, or unexpected realities, right? But when you look at the study of disasters, what we understand is that there's actually a history, a history in which we see communities, businesses, large organizations at micro, meso, macro level being able, right, to actually uh, understand the reality of disasters, prepare, plan, mitigate for disasters and actually respond and recover. So when it comes to being um, in, in the field, working in disaster management, understanding what academia has to offer, we are able to distill this information, distill the learning practices, look at the different policies and understand how all these systems work together to make it conducive for a business to be able to, to be robust right and able to uh, to stand to withstand the different shock absorbers so that is an encapsulation of what the field of um, disaster management is all about it is imperative that targeted efforts to distinguish disasters from emergencies and to promote disaster awareness within the sme sectors is made additionally and equally important is the need to provide roadmaps opportunities and initiatives by the public and private sector actors to enhance SME preparedness to disaster risks. Building back better calls for strong partnership with development actors and the public sector to source for financing to us towards risk-informed investments, really identifying sustainable risk transfer solutions. And we all live in a risk society. It's not a matter of if a disaster will strike, but more of when. So resilience building and building back better requires that all of society approach. So Invest in Africa is uh, undertaking a number of ongoing initiatives to enhance the resilience of uh, small and medium enterprises because uh, SMEs are the focus of uh, Invest in Africa. So first of all, last year in 2020, we did launch a survival toolkit that consists of information and guides that SMEs can make quick reference to and how to guide. This toolkit has been launched to over 6,000 SMEs across Africa. Secondly, is that uh, we did launch um, an SME recovery and resilience program in partnership with the MasterCard Foundation. The program covers four components. One is a series of masterclasses by experts who we partner with to train and uh, provide the SMEs that are on our network or on our platform with uh, key information on how they can manage the immediate impacts of COVID-19. The other component is um, a peer mentorship uh, sessions where SMEs are um, connected to 
successful business leaders who provide them with uh, tips and mentor them on a structured basis. The program also has a follow-up coaching uh, program which entails uh, more close support and hand-holding by internationally trained and certified coaches. And then the fourth component is the investor readiness program which is uh, geared towards supporting the SMEs in becoming business ready or bank ready or investor ready. Second initiative of uh, Invest in Africa towards um, supporting SMEs with uh, resilience is uh, that we have launched and, um, a dialogue series that addresses or focuses on disaster risk uh, resilience. The dialogue series is themed around, al alongside three priority action areas of the Sendai framework which uh, include understanding disasters and risks, investing in uh, disaster and risk, and enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response in recovery, and building back better, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. So in organizing this uh, dialogue series, we have brought together uh, stakeholders, convening stakeholders, on a round table together with SMEs to create awareness and start raising risk literacy in order to help SMEs in focusing away from disaster management uh, focus of response to management, to mitigation, to, to thinking about how this can be a strategy or a process that is embedded in their, uh, in their business practice in order to minimize um, disasters. Thank you so much um, IIA, uh, the technical team for bringing us on. We now move on um, to the next uh, segment and I would like to, ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure of inviting the country manager of IIA, Ms. Wageshi Muruki, for the opening remarks. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mothoni. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, all protocols observed. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm aware that uh, we have um, participants joining from different parts of the world for this very important uh, webinar. So my name is Wangeshi Murioki. I am the country director of Invest uh, in Africa. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you as the host of this uh, webinar, which is on enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response to build back better in recovery, rehabilitation and uh, reconstruction. Our theme for this uh, third dialogue series is significant. It's about roadmaps and shock absorbers, instituting and mainstreaming SME disaster risk uh, resilience. And I would like to take this opportunity to recognize and thank our key partners and uh, collaborators in organizing this uh, uh, session. So I would like to single out the Ministry of Public Service and Gender in Kenya, the Mastercard Foundation, Strathmore University Business School, the United Nations Office for Disaster and Risk Reduction, we have Metropole Television and Invest in Africa, which I represent. And I must mention that these organizations and partners have worked tirelessly to bring this uh, initiative to life today. And just to mention that collectively, our sole objective in coming together is to increase the understanding of how to strengthen resilience for small and medium enterprises in Kenya and also in Africa in recognition of the important role that they play as uh, the drivers of uh, our economy. But before we begin, I would just like to 
uh, quickly introduce Invest in Africa for those of us who are new to the to to the organization. So Invest in Africa is a private sector initiative and a network that includes multinationals, corporates, local businesses, public sector organizations, trade associations, uh, development bodies. You know, we work across uh, development finance institutions. And all these share a common mission to empower enterprise and to create sustainable jobs by improving access to markets, access to skills, and finance for SMEs. So IIA is engaging the ecosystem to unlock opportunities for small and medium enterprises. And we firmly also focus on engendering the inclusion of women and youth in corporate uh, in the corporate sector or, or in the corporate organizations across the supply chains. And to facilitate these linkages, we have created a unique digital platform that enables large corporates and organizations to connect to a pool of uh, SMEs or small and medium enterprises. So to date, we are working with 5,000 registered uh, small and medium enterprises from different sectors across the country and we've been able to create over 80,000 new jobs into the economy and uh, link them to opportunities for financing worth about six million US dollars. So why are we here? So first of all, with the onset of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic last year, Invest in Africa being a front runner in working with SMEs realize the need to step up efforts beyond our three pillars of skills, markets and finance, we realized that we needed to support SMEs in building resilience due to the impacts of uh, COVID-19. We conducted a study which uh, pointed to the huge negative effects that SMEs who we already know are particularly vulnerable to disasters due to the lack of investments uh, in disaster risk management that revealed how vulnerable they really were with the job losses, with the business shutdowns, with the loss of livelihoods. We saw an urgent need and we saw this as a key challenge that must be effectively tackled in order to achieve sustainable uh, development. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we are all aware about the impacts of the pandemic and how this has impacted the entire globe. We are now on the third wave of, uh, of, of the virus, which is uh, threatening, and I must say is life threatening. But what we need to look at really are the impacts of its concurrent crisis beyond COVID-19. There is climate change, there is cyber security risk and others which pose an, e an even longer term dilemma. And that's why we came together with our partners and started thinking through what is really needed. And we recognized that there was a significant gap for a framework or a resilience framework for SMEs, a, a framework that would address all facets from awareness, education, policy, training, programs, you know, systems, and other mechanisms that would really support this important constituents of our economy. So we started championing uh, this work and organized a phased planning engagement towards an African MSME resilience framework. And uh, we brought together collaborators and partners who are like-minded, who are working this journey with us and we are very very pleased to have the involvement of the ministry of uh, public service and gender today joining us together with the county governments and others because this is a big issue and a big deal in this country so the first uh, phase of uh, the dialogue series is themed across the priority areas of action of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which has been adopted by the United Nations. So we started this dialogue series last year, where we conducted the first dialogue in, uh, in October, and we discussed on understanding disaster risk. 
The second dialogue series was conducted in January where the theme was on investing in disaster risk for resilience. And what we want to achieve through this dialogue series is to help in creating a culture of risk management in public and in private sector organizations. This is to work to ensure that risk management is not a checklist feature, but rather an integral component within business operations. And we are seeking to sensitize stakeholders on the importance of strengthening disaster management agencies to support um, the development and implementation of comprehensive disaster management programs at SME level. So we are pushing for that inclusivity with the awareness that beyond COVID-19, we need to support SMEs in building capacity to respond to the global realities and environmental threats like uh, I've mentioned, like uh, you know, climate change, as they get back on their feet through recovery uh, efforts. We know that if we neglect these issues, we risk greater social and economic uh, damage. And this suggests that our government needs to include goals to align with these new realities and place more emphasis on the inclusivity of SMEs in the recovery uh, plans. So today we are talking about build back better. And we know that this is a common phrase now, almost a cliche, which is everywhere right now. And uh, build back better is now being used to describe different things and in varying um, contexts. I just want to mention that this is not just a political slogan, but build back better is derived from that official Sendai framework, which was adopted in 2015 as a blueprint for reducing disaster losses and places special emphasis on ensuring, in, on ensuring that capacities are in place for effective um, recovery. And therefore we view this as a critical opportunity. Today's dialogue is a platform for sharing experiences, lessons associated with build, you know, with building back better. So we are joined by representatives from the public sector. We have distinguished and honorable guests that I will be introducing shortly. We've got private sector actors, we have got SMEs represented here, we've got corporates, we've got international organizations, academic institutions, and each of us will be sharing experiences in disaster recovery and reconstruction in support of um, SMEs. We do recognize that this requires an all society approach. It's so important to have a multi-sectoral and, and, and a multi-sectoral approach to the recovery process. And that's why we have the government involved, the county governments involved and private sector we are keen on building these public-private partnerships as ways and approaches in which will help us to deliver the impact that we need in supporting SMEs in building back better. So this is about engagement, it's about sharing uh, knowledge and best practices, and it is expected to drive commitments and actions that will inform a longer term strategy so so that we are not convening when there's another pandemic but ensuring that SMEs are ready for tomorrow's disaster and so we are looking at um, uh, uh, supporting entrepreneurial ecosystem and to also drive policy development so we are looking forward to a great time of learning a great time of sharing, sharing experiences and uh, knowledge and therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, with those few remarks to declare this session open. Um, we'll bring on the keynote speaker, who is our chief guest, who will be launching this forum, who is none other than Honorable Rachel Shebesh, to take on the stage and uh, grace the forum. Asante, thank you, Angeshi. That was really a glowing uh, CV. And uh, thank you to all the members of the panel who are here and other distinguished guests. So I'm here speaking on behalf of my ministry. Uh, I'm in the Ministry of Public Service and Gender, and my cabinet secretary is Professor Margaret Kobia. But really the reason I am here is also because I am the champion of DRR, UN, the UNDRR, because I engaged in it. 
when I was in parliament and to make it quick and short so that because I've seen you, you, you are expecting to get, to get a lot out of this dialogue on Geshe. I think I will not read this speech. I think what I will say is this one, that as government, we are the policy makers. And on the policy around DRR and, and preparing and building back better, I can assure you, you will find very many policy papers that have been produced. Uh, when, you were, when I was in parliament, the issue of legislation where I was passionate about, we passed the legislation in parliament on DRR as well as on climate change, which for me are the intertwined. We did that at the Africa, at the Pan-African Parliament, where I was also a member. We followed up at the East African Community, uh, East African Legislative Assembly, IALA, and we pushed the same agenda. And so um, my, my thoughts would be on getting off and moving is one, when we are dealing with the government, we need to get that government has many other things on, it, on, on their plate, too many. And unless we engage government, and I am talking also about the county governments here as well, the national government, county government, in a way that we tie them to the issue of uh, building back better, preparing for disasters, mitigating them, putting resources, what, the way that can guarantee us a, a result is making sure that we have legislation. So our policy lends itself to the legislation. So in Kenya, we can say we have the legislation, but do we have it at the county government? Because there are many of these, uh, everything that is, uh, um, you know, that we need to build back better Wangeshi is at the county level. And uh, we devolved very many functions to the county level. However, we still engage only with the national government, uh, almost blind to the fact that we need to talk to the county government. And therefore, my role, and it is a role that I would be happy to play, mm -hmm. is to get this dialogue taken to the county level. And that is why I'm happy that you have the governor of Nairobi, because it is through them that we can interact directly with the SMEs. What we have done as national government is, is looked for resources to build up the SME uh, 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 structure around the country. And because of that, we have been able to create more jobs by supporting SMEs. And that we have done. However, mitigating uh, the effects of any kind of uh, crisis like what we have now with Corona, it is very painful to watch people who are closing jobs mm -hmm. People are demonstrating, I hear them, I feel them, that they cannot now continue with their business until we are over with the third wave of corona, which has come and is deadly. Government has to make these decisions. They are always, they are never popular, but it's something that government has to do. However, if we had prepared, if we had engaged the SMEs as we are giving them resources, you know, to engage in this kind of dialogue that you are bringing on board here to get, to get with us on ship, on what would happen if a disaster occurred. People are mm -hmm. so used to a disaster being a fire, a flood, still things we have to plan for. But when you come to where people are working, selling wares, it has really never occurred to, mm -hmm. to, to many of us, and I would say this government probably, to look at that risk factor even as we are giving resources, so that when you are giving somebody resources, from whichever way where we've gotten the resources because we get from government but we also get from many partners banks have really come on board to help us give resources to smes we should have in that agreement somewhere a drr component so that this business that we are funding getting partners to fund getting banks to give us better rates when this gentleman this young lady closes shop like they have done now how do they manage what happens to them how is it mitigated? So I am here to say that the structure that works for government is where you, get, you tie government down to resources, which means that once we get this legislation to the county government, the county governments will then be obligated to put resources on it. For as long as we are just doing courtesy calls and talking and saying hello, you know, having this kind of forums, we have not tied anybody down. You will have one, two, three, four governors 
who will embrace it and one of them is uh, governor Otichilo. i told you i i was hoping to be near governor Otichilo actually is the one we work together with uh, to, to to bring the climate change uh, bill that is in parliament today which has a lot of components on preparing uh, for disasters and as long as we don't tie them to that so i am ready as government but also as a champion to work with county governments to to step down drr and build and, and 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 supporting smes when there is this kind of calamities to the county level two when we are speaking to legislators i have said a thousand times step down the language uh -huh. step down the language do not assume everybody and that knows what the sendai framework for action means and while I was advocating for a caucus of legislators who I know are passionate about area, their areas having disasters all the time. So they, 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 it's, it's something they deal with on a daily basis. We had formed that caucus before I left parliament. I think we should revive it because these are the young, this, a caucus means people who are passionate about something. It is recognized by the speaker. It is resourced so that they are able to go around the country, they're able to have meetings. Because I'm hoping that after this dialogue, you will want to meet the people who make their decisions. And the people who make those decisions are those who are in the National Assembly as we're speaking now, those who are in the Senate. Because as government, as much as we've prepared the policy, as long as, as much as we've pushed the legislation, there is the aspect now of funding. I'm ready to have that, uh, to, to work with you and the team that is here today, the dialogue that you're going to have. And lastly, to talk a bit about Africa, because we had also done it at the Pan-African Parliament. Uh, the Pan-African Parliament uh, motto is One Africa, One Voice. We have realized that when we speak as Africa, we get much more than when we are speaking country to country. So we did form the parliamentary uh, caucus again at the Pan-African Parliament on the preparedness of disasters. And that is something we can still look at. Lastly, let me just say that um, nothing happens without resources and nothing happens without partners and CSOs. We would be unable to move if we did not have partners who are willing to put in the time and the resources. Neither would we move if we didn't have the community-based organizations that move. So I want to acknowledge you, Wankishi, and your organization and your team because here we are because of you. I should have been the one calling this meeting or maybe another minister from the relevant ministries, but here you are. We don't take you for granted, we appreciate you. UNSIDR that continues to support us and continues to support Africa, please let us know. I'm happy that I saw somebody from academia here uh, and uh, many other partners that I am seeing here. Let us know what you need. Our doors are open. One of the biggest uh, drawbacks on this issue has been knocking on doors that are not opening. It is there for my work to knock on those doors and open them. But most importantly, let's go to the ground and prepare our SMEs for any other disasters. So let's go to the ground. I am willing to take you to county commissioners. I'm willing to take you to county governments because that is the role that chief administrative secretaries play just in case people really wonder what we do. We are in charge of the liaison between parliament also the liaison between county governments so that is our work i am also going to bring on board my colleagues who can be able to take one aspect and the other for example my colleague of trade i think which is where sme is uh, sitting that of finance because of putting on resource putting in resources so i'm looking forward uh, to the to the to what this dialogue will come up with because i believe it will give us the framework and the and the roadmap going ahead thank you angeshi and everybody else thank you all right Wow. Thank you so, so much, uh, Honorable uh, Rachel Shebesh, for that very, very passionate um, speech and for gracing and uh, launching the Dialogue Series 3. And I must say that this is such a strong, strong launch that is backed by commitment. And I know that this is not just lip service, but you have uh, articulated ways in which you can support this initiative of invest in africa to spread its wings to the county level and to work um in, in in coordinating the relevant ministries and that is an area where we need that strong collaboration 
really really having a champion like uh, madam rachel is so useful and it's, it's timely at this particular point in time you have outlined things that we need to do like uh, simplifying the language pushing for uh, resources getting down to the to the ground level which is what we are going to take on right now and i must say that with what you have outlined you're already helping us to start defining the pillars of what that uh, framework really is going to be built on and so we are truly grateful we are truly happy we look forward to those introductions to the caucus and to the key um, contacts and more so you've made a very strong and important point that nothing really happens without resources and uh, it's great to have a champion who truly understands that it's time to, for government to start making risk-informed investments you know there's no point of ruling out resources when the uh, component on risk is not well integrated so we are thankful and we look forward we want to walk this journey with you and would love you to hold our hand from the position that you hold and we do thank you and appreciate you very very much so uh, without further ado we don't know whether the um, the governor has managed to rejoin but if not allow me to move on to the next session where we will be watching a short testimonial video on uh, SMEs who have some testimonials to share on resilience now one thing that we know about the pandemic is that there are businesses that have been massively affected but we also reached out to companies within our ecosystem that have made something out of the pandemic and they either have planned or have put in place some measures to ensure that there is business continuity i would like to take this time to thank those smes that have contributed to um, building up of this video in order to share knowledge because this is a practice that we want to encourage as invest in africa it is an all society approach we can learn from anybody and uh, given the fact that we work with so many smes we are driving linkages from different angles we've also come across businesses that have stories to showcase that have learning and and, and have something to share with the smes and so at this point in time i want to just acknowledge those companies and uh, welcome the tech team to play the video uh, for us to watch these testimonials before we bring on to the panel. My name is Mary Ketchup. I'm the Managing Director for Line Plus Group. Line Plus Group is a synergy of three companies, Line Art Solution, where we do printing uh, and we major in flex of printing, we printing of labels. And then Plus Packaging, we major in uh, packaging, uh, manufacturing of plastic containers, and we serve the agrochemical industry, the cosmetic industry, food and beverage, and also the pharmaceutical industry. Then the third company is Aroma Care, where we do manufacturing of uh, beauty care, hair care, body care, uh, and also institution and industrial cleaning solutions. Uh, during the pandemic, the disaster really affected our business, uh, and especially because of uh, the instruction of social distancing. In manufacturing, it's a more physical work, so uh, having to keep people social distance was a bit of a problem for us. So we had to reduce our floor staff, so we had to let go some of our cashews so that we were able to comply with the social distancing uh, part of it. Lockdown, which also affected us that we were not able to meet our clients because we normally produce and we deliver our for our clients. So specific working hours also made us let our staff go home earlier before time and this reduced the production capacity for uh, for our factory. So with less mas machine utilization, that meant that then our production costs went high. Uh, we also had a lot of destruction uh, of low material supply. There was a lot of delay from uh, imported uh, low material. Uh, there was also cost uh, in it the prices increased which also again increased, increased our cost of production so that meant that we had to increase our prices which was not very friendly for our client 
we also had to look into what was not moving in the market and reduce production an example i would give like um the hotel industries were not doing well so our production for a line like water bottles that was not moving so we had to quickly make a decision on how to spot to stop production for that this reduced our cash flows and also our staff were affected because we were not able to pay overtimes uh because they were working less hours then uh in terms of uh clients were also not able to pay us in time uh because they also had reduced cash flow so lockdown uh social distancing cash flow inefficiency in our production those are some of the things that really affected our production or how we rebuilt ourselves was that we were quickly able to analyze uh, the trends of how the business was going uh, and we realized now that the customers were buying more online so we quickly were able to develop an e-commerce platform where we were able to sell our products especially on the cosmetic industry we were also able to come up with a way to negotiate with our customers that they pay us up front uh, because we were also buying raw materials in terms of cash we were also able to negotiate with our banks so that they are able to they they they, they, re they restructured our loans so that our, our monthly liabilities were not so much we were also able to quickly introduce doing our meetings and uh, discussing on the strategic way of how to continue doing our business on zoom through our staff and uh, we also used a lot of the time that uh, uh, most of our senior managers were not working. We used a lot of that time in training for them and were able to utilize the time instead of having the people go home all the time, uh, use the time in terms of uh, the, 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 the most administration work that we needed to do that we had not maybe had enough time to think. So we used a lot of time sitting, rethinking and restructuring the business so that we were able to come up with a good way of uh, moving forward. So during COVID, we also realized that the consumer behavior has changed and we realized that the consumer want more information of what it is that they are consuming. They are more conscious and more concerned about the health of the product that they, they, they consume now. So we came up with a digital platform that we call the Fito app, where we are offering services for traceability, transparency and feasibility. And in the platform, we allow clients like ourselves to put more information about their product for the consumer to communicate with the consumer more than what it is that you can be able to put in the label. Uh, now, being prepared for a similar disaster, I would not say that yes, we are prepared for a similar disaster. What I would say is that uh, during the pandemic, because we had a lot of time, we used a lot of time to do our risk assessment and we were also able to do our risk register so yes, we are aware of our risks and we have a register. We also have come up with how we can be able to mitigate, mitigate and reduce uh, and put risk control in our organization. So if we got a similar disaster, uh, because a disaster is one of the risks that we have, we, we analyzed, we would be prepared to respond quickly. Uh, we are aware now of what we can predict what uh, scenario it would be and we have we are putting together resources on how it is that we can fully be prepared we know we need to change how we do our business we have also been able to analyze that uh, there, 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 there are areas that we had not explored uh, in a huge way and we are looking into that and I would give an example that in our cosmetic industry we had not looked so much in the manufacturing of the cleaning and the disinfecting and this is an area that we're exploring. So it, uh, as much as it was a disaster that, that brought in, we were also able to, to see an opportunity in that. So preparedness, yes, we know how to mitigate our risk. We know also how to look for opportunities through a disaster, uh, but we have a long way to say that, yes, we would be fully prepared for any similar disaster like that one. My name is Jimmy Malu, CEO and Director of Dots and Graphics Limited. Dots and Graphics Limited, we specialize in graphic design, printing, and branding. In 2020, COVID-19 really affected our business. Uh, before COVID-19, I guess we were, not I guess, I guess we were really busy and um, life was okay. COVID-19 came and changed how we did things. Uh, for instance, um, we, we had credit facilities in most companies. They stopped giving us credit. 
because they had to buy things cash so they sell to us cash at the same time we could not sell cash to our customers because um, they didn't feel right because everything was changing so fast we had to give them credit so we will sell something on credit get paid after 60 days we buy something immediately cash and that really affected our cash flow so immediately we started changing a lot of things how we do things we had to shut down for a while um, we shut down for almost a month and after that um, i guess when you start looking at your bank account and realizing that um, you need to do something there's no money because you have to pay your salaries there's no money and uh, pressure from employees you know and pressure from the landlord so you quickly come up with a, with a, with a solution so what we did we we started working from home so you see in our kind of business uh, we do graphic design, print and brand. So in our kind of business, you can't take printing at home. You can't take branding at home. So most of the things were design. And uh, design was not really our core or our strong department in terms of bringing cash flow. It was the production side, the branding side, the printing side was our core. So we realized that uh, with the kind of money that design is bringing, is not able to sustain us because most of our clients uh, also shut down or start working from home and there's no demand for, for for graphic design work but then we sat down and uh, thought about it and decided wait a minute everything is now going online why don't we try and do digital marketing and we restructured ourselves so we had a team that uh, will just do digital marketing and uh, we'll probably give them briefs we started doing, selling ourselves to our clients, like, hey, we can do digital marketing. Uh, we are here, call us, we'll give you a solution. So, with all that, what we realized is that um, we now want to set up a small advertising agency, you know what we call below the line advertising agency, uh, such that uh, we are not competing with above the line, you know, the big agencies, the advertising agencies. We just do, you know, the below the line. And that is what, uh, and that's where the money is. Uh, clients come in, clients need a quick design. We do it, turnaround time is very fast. So we started a new company, uh, registered a new company, just under our, our, our own um, umbrella. So the new company is called Drive Digital. It's a, it's a digital advertising platform. We mount them on cars, on the rear windshield of cars, and then we sell advertising space to clients. So, uh, what we've learned at the end of the day is that um, you always have to have something on the side for a rainy day. We as a company never thought that we'll have a rainy day. We'll uh, have a small, a small small kitty put somewhere, you know, just for team building, you know, little promotional stuff and stuff, I mean, things like this. We didn't realize that uh, if we if we ever get to a disaster, <coughs> you will need money to, to sustain your business. And honestly speaking, big lesson learned is save money for a rainy season. So from there, what we start doing is every payment that we get, we take almost half of it to put it aside for a rainy season. Because you never know. Disaster can happen anytime. My name is Bernadette Kanja regiment of Osprey suppliers. I'm the managing director. Our job involves making uniforms for the staff, uh, including the military. We do uh, the whole set from top to bottom, the capes, the uniform and shoes. Uh, so what uh, the company went through during the COVID-19 is that uh, we lost so many clients. There were some that we had uh, done some work for, but now it became difficult for them to pay us. Uh, we have other clients who had to cancel orders because we were we had requested them uh, to pay us some down payments, and that was too difficult for them. Uh, so it has really take it really took time for us to even to move on with the business, we couldn't pay salaries, couldn't pay rent. So I decided just to 
take some time and within that time I just got another client who gave us some reasonable job. But now the problem was how to get the capital to finance the work when the rest have not paid. So I went out looking for financiers. I remember it was a bank that uh, we got the job. I went to them for finances, but they, they refused to finance us. So in the process of looking for who can finance me, uh, I came across now the Invest in Africa. Someone introduced me and told me how, how to go about it. And I joined, uh, and that's how they, I became their member now. They introduced me to some financial. Uh, so after joining uh, Invest in Africa, I have learned a, a bit of skills as to how to manage the, the business and also to manage finances. One of the biggest uh, achievements I've had from them is the coaching. Uh, I went through the coaching process and now uh, I realized so many things that I wasn't doing very well. I realized the areas I could put more effort, especially in, uh, uh, in doing marketing. So uh, I've talked to my team and uh, we have started doing aggressive marketing. We have gone back to our old clients who who left uh, uh, maybe a year or two years ago. We've talked to them and uh, there is some hope that they, they'll be back. So uh, through the aggressive marketing, I foresee us uh, moving very far, uh, not just to break even, but even to move to uh, the highest level that we can. Because once we have a, a lot of clients coming every now and then it will mean our work will be continuous and when one client is unable to pay in good time the other one will pay and we'll keep moving on as we wait for for everything to go back to where we were or even get better. Uh, so due to COVID-19 uh, we had also to prevent ourselves so we've been avoiding to see our clients, uh, like visiting them in their offices. We've been uh, meeting with them virtually, or uh, also emails, or using the phone. And also in the offices, and the, in the office here, and also in the factory, we are also very careful. We have to take a certain number of, uh, of the foodies. Like if the job is a lot, we have to get some work during the day and others during the night, depending on the how much can sit while doing the social distancing. Uh, in terms of disasters and considering that it, any other one can happen any time and nobody knows when, I've been thinking that uh, I should invest in a different area or I diversify just to make sure that if a similar thing happen, I'll be able to get something from this, the other business and be able to continue with business as usual. My name is Alex Mosembi and I'm one of the founder of Africa Collect Textiles. Africa Collect Textiles is a social impact enterprise that collects used textiles and footwear for reuse and recycling. This way, we relieve the impact the fashion industry has on our planet, reduce pollution caused by dumping and burning, create jobs, save money for local businesses, and generate funds for charity. We are living in very uncertain times, whereby we never anticipated the effect and the disaster of coronavirus. Uh, basically, it has been a, a tough time for many businesses, including Africa Collect Textile, uh, somewhere last year uh, in March, uh, when Corona started or entered into Kenya, we were in a confusion time and uh, we decided to, to freeze our operation and to minimize cost. We decided as directors to freeze our salaries 
because at the end of the day there was nothing which was going on. Number two, uh, some of our beans were closed because uh, we are in learning institutions such as in Strathmore University, Nova School of Pioneer, and uh, these are learning institutions and were closed. Therefore, that means like uh, our operation was closed. Even shopping malls between March and June, they, they were closed, so nothing was happening. That's how we were really affected. We decided to rethink about the whole business. Uh, one, because we felt that uh, then people are not going to the shopping malls or to the public place where to drop their textiles. And we felt then we need to revolutionize our business. Uh, we tried now to educate and to come up with awareness and we decided now to do what we call like a dot-to-dot -dot pickup which up to date we are doing. So we went to social media and shouted and tell people then our beans are closed from the learning institution and from the shopping malls. Then they can call us for and we can pick the items from their from their doorstep. That's how we were able to, to resolve the, the issue of COVID-19. And it has become a culture and therefore at the moment we receive even more items from the public through door-to-door -door pickups. Product wise we decided also to sell our items through the social media or online marketing like our rugs or basically our product and that's how we managed to, to, to maintain our revenue and, and, and our revenue shot up by engaging the, the, the online community. For future disasters, I feel we are much more prepared. We never anticipated the issue of COVID since I was born, it's happening for the first time for me. And as a, as a general manager for Africa Collector, textile is a, is a learning experience. So this is something we have to live up with and we are, we are prepared. So businesses, number one, has to cope up with saving and to ensure their cash flow is never affected, to know what they are going to spend on. That should be a very considerate, not just to spend things, money for the sake of spending things. So people have to be really careful uh, on how they spend their, their, their money. Uh, also, another point is that um, business has to go online. We don't need to have a, what we call like physical shop anymore. And, and that's how the, the COVID-19 has given us a, a learning experience. We can sell our product now online and we not necessarily need to you know, to, to display our items for people to come and, and, and walk into the shop and buy the items. So that's another thing that businesses, and including us, need to adopt. Thank you so much Jay, for that video. Ladies and gentlemen, powerful messages from the video that Build Back Better presents an opportunity for innovative thinking, identifying sustainable solutions for resilient lives and livelihoods. We will now move on to our panel discussion, a segment that will help us to shift our mindset from plans to action. How do we build back better from pandemics such as the COVID-19, but also from other environmental, technological and biological disasters? Please join me in welcoming our four members of the panel. We have Mr. Julius Kabubi, Mr. Robert Nyamu, Mr. Carl Newell and Dr. Njoki Mwarumba. Mr. Julius Kabubi is a senior program officer with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, Mr. Robert Nyamu is a partner and technology consulting leader with Ernest & Young East Africa. Mr. Carl Newell is an agriculture sustainability leader at Ernest Ernest and Young in Washington. And last but not least, Dr. Njoki Mwarumba is from the Strathmore University Business School Disaster Management Cycle and also an Assistant Professor of Emergency Management and Disaster Preparedness in the University of Nebraska, Omaha. I will go straight into the program because of time and I will start with Mr. Julius Kabubi. Julius, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction that was made reference to earlier, 2015-2030, urges national and local governments as well as communities to prioritize building back better in recovery, rehabilitation and reconstruction from disasters. In partnership with government and other development partners, what is UN Disaster Risk Reduction doing to ensure 
that we learn from one another and from our from experiences including sharing failure and learning from past failure in order to leverage these lessons to improve preparedness to build back better julius over to you we you have five minutes thank you uh, thank you Madoni. thank you for uh, introducing me uh, I want to be, first of all, I want to thank the organizers on behalf of the UNDRR, the Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, for uh, bringing us on board as partners in this. And uh, I was also moved a bit by uh, the small demonstration that was done by SMEs, the conversions that were done. And if you are around, maybe I start there before I say what we are doing as, at uh, the UN, uh, UNDRR. I think by now many entities be it SMEs, private companies, businesses, have become aware of the growing risk environment and therefore their sustainability uh, uh, depends on them becoming a change agent capable of generating resilience, uh, not only for themselves, but also for the employees as we have heard from, um, from the conversions. Uh, the survival or the, uh, to survive, they definitely need to understand the importance of building resilience early, early on in business increasing resilience, improving adaptation, and strengthening their preparedness uh, to respond. We have seen the increasing uh, frequency and intensity of disasters, which is driven basically by uh, severe weather and extreme climate uh, events, which underscores the importance of increasing the understanding of the complexity of risk and the need to urgently integrate disaster risk reduction into business practices and in, in investment uh, decisions. These challenges uh, of climate change are definitely too great to be tackled by a single actor, and thus uh, the need for a joint action. I wanted to state that because um, the adaptation that has been done by the SMEs who give their testimony is quite encouraging that they were able to turn around and turn uh, the disaster of COVID-19 into uh, some, uh, some opportunity and uh, for survival. Now, when I come to look at what are we doing ourselves at the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, we bring governments and partners and communities together uh, to reduce risk and losses to ensure a safer and sustainable future. I, I think you all know that we are the custodian of the Sendai Framework, which is a global uh, blueprint uh, for, uh, for guiding, uh, guiding uh, communities, countries, and even uh, and even um, uh, uh, member states in uh, reducing risk. In terms of uh, risk knowledge, we provide tools such as the prevention web. Uh, I don't know how many of the participants uh, make reference to the prevention web. And this is a community site where we deposit a lot of information and a lot of tools that can be used uh, to, uh, to do disaster risk reduction. Uh, in fact, we also develop things we call the words into action. These are guidelines on how best can you be able to do, for example, enhancing disaster risk reduction, enhancing preparedness, enhancing response, uh, effective response, all those things. We prepare guidelines uh, so that we can support the practitioners on how they can go uh, uh, on using those tools. In fact, in uh, one of the words into action, you'll find it's discussing about um, enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response. And these guidelines provide key principles uh, and uh, required actions as outlined in the SADI framework to enhance disaster preparedness and effective response in action. We organize consultative meetings. We bring stakeholders like you together. We, we, we organize the global platform, regional and national stakeholders platforms. We do DRL capacity development through training on various aspects of DRL, and we have, in fact, a, a, global, a global education and training institute which tailor any form of DRL queries that uh, any customer or any stakeholder may want. At the global level, our organization has established what we call the Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Risk uh, Resilient Societies. Normally, we call it the ARISE network. And this is a network of private sector entities. Members uh, of this entity uh, normally has, has committed uh, to support the implementation of the Sendai framework uh, and has aligned also to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement 
the new urban agenda and the agenda for humanity. UNDRL regional office is uh, leveraging on this, uh, this kind of initiative to promote the participation of the private sector also here in Africa. And I know uh, even after this, the dialogue will be reaching out to many of you uh, to brief you on where we are in terms of uh, creating this initiative in Africa. In July, as the COVID was going on this year, uh, 2020, sorry, uh, we also launched a short publication on reducing risk and building resilience of SMEs to disaster. Having realized the, 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 the situation where SMEs were going through, we, we, we came up with a, a global kind of um, research to see how best can we support SMEs uh, to build their resilience. The publication highlights the importance of SMEs to economies. Uh, looking at this from a global lens, it highlights the critical factors for building SME resilience through DRR and finally uh, analyzes uh, critical barriers for SMEs and uh, gives uh, recommendations thereafter. I will be sharing this with the uh, with the uh, Invest in Africa uh, for reference so that they can get the reference. We have this um, a global, uh, global risk assessment framework and uh, it's composed of experts, which we have also representation here from Africa, working around the clock on risk monitoring and analysis. And if you allow me, moderator, just in one minute, I can summarize what the latest global assessment report was in 2019. And uh, it paints a future which is full of great uncertainties as far as disaster risk uh, uh, reduction is concerned. It observes the complexity of uh, the systemic nature of risk beyond what we already know. Uh, what is evident from this report is that change is happening more quickly and surprisingly across multiple dimensions and scales than we ever thought possible. So human activities of course grows exposure, increases the propensity for systems reverberations, setting up some feedback, feedback loops with the cascading consequences that are difficult uh, to foresee. So systems are no longer linear, that is some of the findings that this report has seen. Uh, uh, they are no longer linear and this is a situation and therefore uh, promoting a situation where surprise is the new normal. So we get surprised every time. A non-linear system, therefore, in hazards, intensity, and frequency, is already, is already a reality affecting the intensive and extensive nature of risk. Unfortunately, SMEs uh, are the main as the main contributors of the GDP are the main victims when these uh, changing realities within the disaster risk ecosystems happens. So I want to add there and perhaps uh, connect um, with what was discussed by those, um, uh, what was demonstrated by those uh, SMEs, and of course connecting to what uh, Shabes said that uh, this is not one uh, disaster risk is an all of us business. We need to connect and put up everything, connect all the dots, uh, so that we can be able to move forward as one resilient society. Over to you, uh, moderator. Thank you so much, Julius. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's about joint action. It's about uh, that all of society approach. You have told us about the tools, the words into action, and also networks. So thank you so much, Julius. We will now move on to our next um, panelist uh, this afternoon, uh, Mr. Robert Nyamu. And Robert, the risks emerging from cyber insecurity have been heightened by the new way of working uh, brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. How can SMEs build resilient ICT systems and trigger actions to build back better in the face of cyber threats? Over to you, Robert, thank you. Thank you, Mudoni, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, uh, and or good evening, good morning, depending on where you're seated. Uh, so yeah, so as, as, as introduced, uh, my name is Robert Nyamu, I'm a partner at EY, and um, I make a living out of advising businesses around their technology strategies on, uh, on matters cybersecurity, on data governance, uh, and, and technology infrastructure, and a few other areas. But today, I think, been asked to share some thoughts around uh, cybersecurity and how organizations can can go about building 
uh, cyber resilience and and um, and you know build back better, uh, which we're all talking about at this uh, at this point in time, given what the pandemic has uh, you know has, has uh, visited upon us. So I, I think the, there are a couple of things that I, I, I wanted to just uh, talk about. I think um, you know one of the things that and, and just listening to the SMEs. Uh, that we were sharing, uh, you know, the experiences earlier. I think once the uh, once the pandemic befell us, especially in this part of the world, uh, in March last year, which is almost uh, exactly a year ago, um, you know, the various SMEs obviously had to, um, you know, kind of reflect in terms of how they were going to continue in operation and how they were going to, um, you know, basically activate, uh, you know, their business continuity plans, uh, whether those were written or not. Uh, you know whether those were in the founders' minds, and you know, or whatever the whatever, however structured the business continuity plans were. And one of the key underlying, um, um, you know, ingredients they had there is how to leverage technology. And um, I think what we've seen uh, with the, with a lot of the SMEs, uh, some of who are my clients and others, uh, you know, just listen to the experiences and from even from the, uh, you know, some of the SMEs that spoke earlier is um, there have been varying degrees of success in terms of getting that right. So technology is a very powerful tool um, in terms of uh, what it has been able to do to enable SMEs and other corporates as well uh, to basically bounce back and uh, reestablish their businesses, uh, find new ways of con uh, connecting with their customers, with their suppliers, with their stakeholders, uh, with their bankers, with, with, with their, basically the entire stakeholder group. And, um, and, and, and we have seen that the, the, the true power of technology in that full context, because in the past people were, I think, um, you know, talking about some of these things in a cliche uh, kind of manner. But I think uh, given what we have all gone through in the last one year, uh, I think we can all see that. So the flip side of that is that uh, the more technology deployments you have around your operations, that will be it, how you connect with your customers, with your suppliers, um, you know, and, you know, the, your wider stakeholder group, or all of them. Uh, come cybersecurity risks, and and, um, and and those are, I mean, that's exactly the flip side. As you, as the more you digitize and digitalize, uh, you know, cyber risks come come uh, come with that. But I think the the, the advice that uh, I would share, and that uh, you know, the advice I'd share with the with the with the, with the members on the call, is uh, is not to roll back from that and maybe. Uh, be fearful of the cyber risks, but rather to embrace them and, and you know and uh, basically adapt and deal with them. And because the um, what we've seen that the success stories of the SMEs and other corporates and other you know uh, however structured the you know whatever structure the organizations are, the ones that have achieved success are the ones that have been able to embrace digital in the true sense. But and also as they do that, address the cyber risks. And I'll share in the few minutes that I have. The, the you know the, the you know what a typical cyber risk framework uh, con uh, you know contains and uh, and and thereafter I think uh, you know uh, we agreed with the with the IIA that um, as an organization I'll be happy to uh, you know to contribute some time basically to share with the members uh, these topics in, in greater detail so I'll just cover the framework uh, as an overview in terms of what. Um, you know, organizations need to have in place to basically have a robust cybersecurity framework, and we'll be happy to uh, pick up this in, in greater detail at a later date. So, the first thing that um, the, an organization needs to do, the SME needs to do, is to carry out a risk assessment. So, the first thing, once you've once you've um, you've gone about the thought process of how you're going to remodel your operating, uh, how you're going to you know change around or redesign your operating model and how you're going to leverage uh, technology and digital to connect with your stakeholder group, with customers, suppliers, bankers, etc. Um, you then need to see what the impact of doing that is in terms of the cybersecurity risk. So, uh, and that is, um, and the, the first step in that, the absolute fundamental first step in doing that is carrying out a risk assessment, a comprehensive risk assessment, which then tells you how the changes you have made have affected your previous risk profile. So. Um, you know, so you, you, you have a look at that, you come up with a completely new risk framework uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how your organization is now structured uh, in the new context, and then you start from there. And the four things that you need to have in your cybersecurity framework uh, are basically, um, you know, controls uh, or mechanisms around being able to complicate uh, the ability of uh, any intended, uh, you know, attacker to basically compromise your systems. And depending on on the, and I, I appreciate I'm speaking to a multi, 
uh, sectoral uh, uh, you know, group here, uh, depending on how your organization is, is structured and, and you know, we have very diverse um, you know, operating models uh, represented here, probably as diverse as the number of organizations here, except for some similarities for those who are in the same sectors. Um, you then you know, determine um, what, based on the, 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 um, your, the maturity profile of your organization, how your organization is set up, you, you then work through the process of determining um, four things, which is um, what controls you're going to have to basically complicate uh, and make it difficult for your, um, you know, for your organization to be, uh, your organization systems and, and processes um, and the environment to be compromised by, by, by a, an, an attacker or, you know, a criminal, cyber criminal. Uh, you also, uh, you also need to look at the second bit, which is putting in place controls and mechanisms to be able to, if in the event that you're not able to uh, prevent, so the, the first control is around prevention. Uh, if you're not able to prevent an attack from happening, how do you go about building controls to detect an, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, an attack that has happened or uh, you know, uh, a cyber crime that has happened? And, and, and that's the second most important thing uh, that you need to have. And the third thing that you need to have is also a response mechanism. So the organization needs to develop a response mechanism in terms of when, a, when, a, uh, when an attack happens, when a cyber crime happens, uh, you know, somebody has managed to gain access to, uh, you know, to your environment, what do you do next? And how do you respond effectively? And how do you restore your operations back to, uh, back to normal? And, and last but not least is to educate your workforce and your stakeholder group who are interacting with your environment. So if you have, so the most important, uh, you know, the most important facet there is your employees uh, and, and any contractors that you have who have direct access to your environment. If, if, you, if you're indeed leveraging, uh, you know, technology and digital in an expansive way, there are, there are SMEs these days who will have uh, people accessing the environment directly, of course, with the right controls, etc. Otherwise, then it can all go, um, you know, it can all go bad from there. So I, I think those are the four fundamental aspects that you need to have. And maybe just to share some additional details on that. So as you start off on this journey, um, the, the, the things that are correlated here is, first of all, mapping out your transformation journey in terms of, the, you know, the, your digital transformation journey. What is it that you're going to change about your operations and your operating model? leveraging technology and how you're going to do that. That's the first step. Then the second step is to carry out a risk assessment of the changes that you have made or that you intend to make to your operations. What does that mean in terms of introducing uh, new risk vectors to your operations? And how are you going to deal with that? So before you do it, not whilst you've done it, what before you do it and you need to be agile about that because you can actually start the process you don't have to have it perfect before you start the process but you need to be absolutely cognizant and you must do the first two things first which is your digital transformation strategy and what risks does that introduce once you have done or you know once you implement it in full what is that going to mean in terms of new risk vectors um uh, you know and how is that going to impact your organization and then the rest you can actually um put in place as you move so as we as we say in the in the technology space, uh, you basically you you build the plane as you're as you, as you're flying it. So, uh, and the reason I say that is because um, life is very fast paced, and things are not going to wait for you to get things perfect before you can move. You need to be agile enough that once you've gotten the first two aspects right that I've spoken about, which is your how are you going to transform, what's your strategy around that, and what uh, have you carried out a risk assessment around. The changes that you intend to make, what's that going to mean in terms of new risk vectors to your environment? And then now have the four uh, aspects that I spoke about around having preventative controls that complicate the ability for your environment to be compromised, have detective controls that basically help the organization to detect when, you know, when these things happen, uh, because in some, in, 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 in some cases they will happen, to be very honest. And then, um, you know, the third one is have mechanisms around how the organization would respond effectively and restore operations should this happen. And last but not least is to educate your, uh, your stakeholders, starting with your employees, your suppliers, and anybody who is interacting with your environment uh, on a day-to-day -day basis so that they do not become a risk vector themselves 
and basically uh, become a conduit through which cyber criminals uh, compromise your environment. So there's a lot I can say about this topic for, I, I can, you know, and I've offered uh, through the um, IIA, um, I think Wangeshi and her team uh, can, can arrange, we'll be happy to, um, you know, do a, a, a more, a, a deeper dive around the issues that I've spoken about uh, in order to do justice to that topic. Because cybersecurity is a very pertinent um, issue, a very topical issue, uh, but with the five, six minutes that I have, I think that's the high level I can share, but I'm happy to um, you know, have a session with, with the members uh, thereafter uh, and go into some of these details in, in greater detail, because I'm sure I've created probably more questions than answers here uh, by just the, the thoughts that I've shared. And, and, and because this is a very pervasive and very in-depth topic, I think we'll probably need to have an hour uh, later on, which can be organized by the IIA. I'd like to pause there and go back to the uh, moderator. Go back to you, Mogani. Thank you so much, Robert. You have actually not created confusion. You have actually created an appetite. Uh, we are so looking forward to a dedicated session. We have heard about prevention. We have heard about the response mechanism. We've heard about education. You have set the stage for the work going forward. Thank you very much. I will now move on to, um, to our next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Kyle Newell. And Kyle, thank you for, for, for being patient with us. Uh, we, uh, we definitely want to make sure that we hear what our panelists have to do, uh, have to say to us, because we agreed that this is a session that is practical. So Kyle, the COVID-19 pandemic presented unprecedented disruptions to lives and livelihoods. However, we know that extreme weather effects and other climate hazards also pose an enormous risk to our future. What are some of the efforts going towards disaster risk and climate that SMEs can build on to accelerate Build Back Better initiatives? Over to you, Kyle. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, my, my video, I don't believe, is enabled, but I, I'm more than happy to proceed forward. Um, so I'm, I'm on the advisory board for Andy East Africa. Uh, Andy is the leading network for ecosystem players um, who are working towards the development of small and growing businesses worldwide. Environment, environmental sustainability is a very important topic that we're, we're, we're reaching right now. I'm currently supporting the organization developing its environment and climate change strategy uh, in ways to help entrepreneurs uh, address these specific issues. We will be working through stakeholder sessions over the next several months to develop specific tools for small and growing businesses in East Africa. Um, as Invest in Africa is a member of Andy, we will ensure to get your input and share the results of what is developed out of those consultations. I think if we take a, a step back um, there's a couple of things to keep in mind around climate change and sustainability because there's a lot of different words and things that get thrown around there. One is carbon emissions are, are included but aren't entirety of environmental sustainability. So we also need to be thinking about water usage and, and waste produced. Um, number two, typically drivers which increase long-term profitability such as reducing costs of production is also good for environmental sustainability. So for those who may be more skeptical around environmental sustainability within your own enterprises, there's a win-win scenario that drives both profitability as well as environmental sustainability. Um, and environmental sustainability needs to be looked holistically across the organization. It can't be something that just sits within your marketing department or with the operations department, it needs to really be embraced holistically across the entirety of your enterprise if you're going to move forward. Um, I used to I used to help EY's uh, global program uh, to develop uh, impact enterprises around the, the world. Uh, so Robert may find this very familiar uh, with the seven drivers of growth that I use as a framework to look at environmental sustainability. Um, I will go over some key questions in thinking, uh, in thinking about these key seven drivers and how environmental sustainability can be um, looked at for each particular element within the, within the organization. If we start off with customer, from the onset, businesses make customers their full, uh, best businesses make customers their focal point. They understand that by putting customers' needs and desires first, they can achieve a, a competitive advantage. 
And a couple of questions from the environment, from a sustainability perspective is understanding how your customers view sustainability. Is there a, is there a market advantage for you to be able to post that to them? And number two, is there a sustainable value proposition that you can give to your customers? The second segment is people who are the engines and the drivers of your organization. Without them, you're not going to be able to move forward. Any organization is only as good as the people working for it. Leading businesses build an environment that values diversity, attracts and retains the right people to help them grow their businesses. Do your people, and a couple of questions more particularly into environmental sustainability, do your people understand how environmental sustainable environmental sustainability impacts their work within the business and those results across the rest of the business? Number two, like are your are your people rewarded in thinking about environmental sustainability and embedding it within the operations within the firm? That leads us to the, the third the third uh, third segment of growth, operations. An organization's operating model is the link between its intent, what you want to achieve, and the ability to deliver on it. Having a clear approach that aligns the operation with the strategy will increase a company's ability to achieve its success. In, turn, in regards to environmental sustainability, are your products and services developed, manufactured, and delivered in an environmentally sustainable way? For example, is there a way to reduce packaging, reduce energy costs, develop products that look at the life cycle of a product to, to, to reduce all environmental impacts? Do you have a plan in place? Number, number two, do you have a plan in place in case there are supply chain disruptions, uh, which could result from environmental and climate change changes, especially if you're dealing I mean, across a number of issues? The, the fourth area that I'll address is around finance. All, obviously, all businesses need funds to grow, and how a business manages its money and its new investors will determine the course of its future. In regards to environmental sustainability, as more investors and financial providers care about uh, elements such as ESG standards, environmental, social, and government standards, are you able to fully or artfully communicate your standards to potential funders? And this is something that's going to percolate down through the ecosystem, even to small and growing businesses within the next five to 10 years. Number, number two, something more operationally focused, do you have the cash flows, reserves, and access to finance to lessen any environmental shocks that your business may face? Moving on to risk, good risk management delivers reduced volatility within the business. There's a strong correlation between the maturity of a risk management and top and bottom line growth. And a couple of key questions are, are you tracking all of your environmental performances, reporting them to stakeholders, and very importantly, including your people, management, and board to make informed decisions regarding your environmental, uh, your environmental risk. Have you, and number two, have you actually, have you been able to put risk mitigation strategies to address any potential shocks in regards to environmental changes? The sixth element is around transactions. Market leading businesses rarely evolve by organic growth. So basically doing everything yourself. To rise to the top, uh, those businesses seek su successful partnerships. And a key question that comes out of this for environmental sustainability is, are you partnering with, you, with, your, with organizations that can increase your knowledge, grow your capability in regards to environmental sustainability? And then the last, the last area that I'll, I'll touch upon is digital. Technology is transforming every aspect of business, especially as, as we just heard from, from Robert. It enables business leaders to make better, quicker, and smarter decisions that respond to rapidly changing customer needs, improve businesses' performance, and manages risk. And a key question around this for environmental sustainability is, do you have the systems in place to be able to capture collect, analyze, to make business decisions that impact, uh, which impact your environmental footprint and the creation of long-term value of your, of your company. I know that this is a fast overview, but we will be in touch with, uh, with Invest in Africa over the next couple of months and our ability in developing new tools and solutions and developing the consultations with you. We look forward to working with you 
and hopefully uh, within our workshops and the tool development uh, over the next couple of months. Thank you so much, Kyle. You you have actually landed the, the climate topic in such a practical way. Um, I would obviously uh, throw it to Wangeshi to see if there is any way that we can have the seven questions in a write-up that can be shared with the participants. But we also take note of the commitment going forward and the work with I Invest in Africa on developing tools and solutions that will be of use to our SME. Last but not least, um, I would like to, to have um, the input of Dr. Njoki Mwarumba. And Dr. Njoki, education and knowledge are critical pillars in building a culture of resilience and building back better. How can SMEs develop roadmaps and shock absorbers for ongoing and future disaster events? Over to you, Dr. Njoki. Thank you very much, Mudoni. And uh, thank you to all of you who have actually stayed with us uh, so far. And I'm particularly honored uh, to have our participants who have joined us today. So um, I think we are here because we understand the seriousness of the moment that we are in, right? I happen to be amongst a group of people who actually spend a lot of time, a lot of learning, right? A lot of research and a lot of um, networking in trying to do the very serious work of understanding disasters, okay? So to that extent, I am a teacher, a mwalimu uh, in, in the university, but I am also very, very passionate about enabling people to really begin to understand what this language that we are using is. So to that extent, I will address some of the differentiations that exist in the language that we are speaking and further explain some of it, right? And the reason I will do that is so that we, I can tie together what our very apt and very able panelists have discussed and the Honorable Shabesh and our leaders here, but also to give you an idea that disasters actually are not new. We see have been caught off guard and flat-footed by this pandemic, but when you look at the work of researchers, not just like myself, but epidemiologists, immunologists, uh, disease um, investigators, they have been dreading the possibility of this kind of pandemic and even worse, right? So in essence, there's a fraternity, a group of people for whom this is not a surprise and two, this is not even the worst of it, okay? So from a disaster management perspective, what am I saying? What I am saying is that we really need to be able to understand that disasters are a way of life. They are here with us, right? And I will refer to that as mainstreaming. We need to understand that disasters tend to get a lot of attention about now during the response phase okay and then once the pandemic kind of passes hopefully soon we tend to very quickly forget okay and move on to the next thing that is very normal and disaster research shows us that that is the tendency of people right is that the focus is on the response phase of disasters but what i would like to introduce to you today is that in the process of mainstreaming disasters, we need to not be obsessively thinking and worried and scared of disasters all the time, but to understand that there are other things that can be done strategically at a personal level, you yourself as an individual at home in your workplace, right? But there is also additionally um, things that you can do to prepare, not only to prepare, but to create those shock absorbers that we are talking about in our theme today, okay? By creating a roadmap. Some of the shock absorbers have been addressed here. And we have also seen uh, some of our um, participants who are interviewed from the SMEs talk about the ways in which their businesses have been readjusted and realigned to meet some of these challenges. What I am here to offer you as an academic and as someone who works in the field of 
doing research and looking at policy is to say that you do not need to recreate the wheel or do the work of trying to recreate the wheel every single time. We are here, academia exists, there's literature out there, white papers, there's research that is ongoing. You yourself, today, right, as you report to this day, uh, to this disaster, are a source of learning and knowledge generation. How? Gather the data about what is going on right now. What is data? Data is your day-to-day functioning, your day-to-day -day operations, the realities that you're living through right now. That becomes the textbook and the playbook which is not if there's another disaster or if there's another um, uh, pandemic, but when another pandemic comes up and when another disaster does happen. Why do I say that? Because if you mainstream disaster thinking, if you look at the history of disaster, and if you look forward to see what the challenges are, especially with the climate change hazards that exist, you understand that what the data trends are telling us is that disasters are going to not only continue, but they will increase in number and occurrence and the intensity within which they happen, okay? So let me step back and explain the difference, for example, between a disaster and an emergency, or an emergency and a catastrophe. And I do that because I do understand that sometimes the language gets mixed up or the understanding. Whenever uh, we were listening to one of the, the participants of, of the SMEs, he talked about generating a fund where they had a small kitty which they would use, right, for just different eventualities, day-to-day -day things, and, and, and even activities like team building, okay? Which is a brilliant idea. You need to have that miscellaneous fund, too, for eventualities, routine eventualities. Those are emergencies. Disasters are events like what we're dealing with right now, which is they are broader in scope. The impact is significant enough to where it interrupts the operations of society as a whole, not just businesses, right? And it has short and long-term impacts. That's a disaster or a catastrophe, which is the kind of event that we are living through right now. So why do I define that? I define that because the tendency is to have that emergency kitty and to not think beyond that emergency kitty. What I am saying that we need to do is understand that we have to think and prepare for those events because they will happen, the disasters and the catastrophes. I also stated that we are in the response phase right now. And what happens during the response phase of a disaster is that there is a window of opportunity to act and to change and to shift the movement within which we were engaged in. We need to change the impetus, the, the direction might need to shift, right? So the thinking requires, and the, and the activity, not just the thinking, but the action requires for us to understand that there are four basic um, phases of disasters. Response, like we're involved in right now, and then we will eventually move into the recovery phase. There is also the mitigation and preparedness phase. Mitigation and preparedness are pre-impact, typically, and then response and recovery is after impact, okay? So now, we tend not to think or prepare or integrate thinking on recovery, mitigation, and preparedness. We are most engaged during response. So when it comes to running an SME, when it comes to running your own personal life, right? It's the reason why you have structural and non-structural strategies that you can use to make yourself as an individual, micro level, your family, your community, and your organization, meso level, macro level, as a country, as a globe. We need to in invest in the structures at all those levels that will make us more resilient to impacts which are unavoidable. 
what is resilience? What resilience is, is building shock absorbers. For an SME, that includes restructuring a business, yes, diversifying your portfolio, yes, but also looking at your employees and understanding that they too need to be protected so that they can come to work, understanding that there is academia and knowledge and research that indicates to us that in, for example, a pandemic, the attrition rate, the, 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 the number of employees that will not show up to, to work, right, are anywhere between 30% to 50%. Why? Because they themselves might be affected by the pandemic or they are the caregivers, right, of, the, of, of their family members, so they will not show up to work. So you as a business, what do you do? Another data point that I would like for us to, to understand is that in the four phases that I talked about, if you invest, and I will use a dollar here, if you invest one dollar in preparing yourself and mitigating for a disaster, which will happen for, for sure, you save anywhere from seven dollars and above in the response phase. So again, coming back to the gentleman during the interviews who talked about how it is that he will now save more for the purposes of disasters, it is because they have actually sat down and understood that the amount of money that they are spending and the resources that they are spending in the response phase is exponentially higher than if you had spent the $1 that I just talked about in mitigation and preparedness. Nothing happens without resources. That is what Honorable Shebesh said. But keep in mind, resources are not just financial. You yourself are a resource. The social capital, your friends, your networks, your, your, your bankers, right? Your vendors, all those are your ecosystem. So understanding that you need to integrate and engage them, not when the disaster is happening or during the response phase, but you need to integrate and understand and get them involved with you in planning for a disaster before it happens because it will happen. So let us understand that there are multiple systems that come into play in disasters and these systems help us build shock absorbers. As we consider the building back theme, let us understand everything might not need to be built back. There are some systems that have gotten us to where we are and therefore need to be absolutely uprooted. There are some systems that need to be restructured and there are some systems that need to be adopted. To that extent, I would like to finalize by saying that IIA in partnership with Strathmore University are actually working on putting together a course that will be held somewhere between June and July of this year. And this course will address in detail, as much detail as we possibly can within the one week, more of the material that I have shared with you. Additionally, today, you will be able to take home a fact sheet that IIA and their partners have put together and that uh, fa fact sheet that you will have gives you a list with contacts of existing initiatives on building SME resilience. These are people and organizations that you can link up with to begin to build these fundamental musingis, the foundations of the incoming uh, and ongoing impacts. So I thank you very much for your time and your engagement. And I look forward to meeting you in the future at Strathmore or with IIA, with whom we continue to engage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joki, and thank you very much, all panelists. We have um, a number of people really appreciating the panelists. Very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, Priscilla Azak should we rely on the government in mitigation of disasters. Thank you, Terry. So that that is a question. Is that that's a question that should we rely on the government in times of disasters? Is that the question, right, Terry? 
Yes, it is. It's a question which is why I'm coming now from Priscilla. Awesome. And and you know what? I, I just would like to have Dr. Njoki answer uh, or, or help us to, to understand that, to answer to that question. Dr. Njoki, do the governments, what the, the role of governments in disasters? Very quickly, over to you, Dr. Njoki. Okay, thank you very, very much. This That is a brilliant question. Should we rely on the government to uh, support us or to mitigate disasters? The answer is yes and no. Okay, and this is what I mean. Disasters are, are such a broad base of impact, and they are such the, the implications of disasters are so significant that there's not a single entity, not a single government anywhere, so-called developed countries, uh, low and middle income middle income countries, none of them, as a singular entity, can handle successfully right any disaster remember i differentiated uh, between an emergency and a disaster a disaster on their own just as a government the government is very central to the process of responding to disasters and not just responding but the entire cycle disaster cycle management the government is central in doing that because it has the mandate of the people however the government also needs to work at using and through the whole of society approach. A term that only means that all hands have to be on deck. It's a haba na haba, ujaza kibaba. Everybody brings something to the table and they address the process, including community. And when I say community, I mean the people themselves, the media, okay? The, 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 juristic, the different jurisdictions that we heard about, the county level, national level, global level, okay? It also means bringing to the table people who are not in agreement necessarily with what the government is saying or they are the critics of the government. And the reason I say that they are important in this process is because they too will need to be heard in the process because if it's a process that does not aggregate information from the whole of society you will have gaps you will have people who have been left behind and unless the society deals with disasters holistically then for example the recovery process will never fully happen because you still have elements and segments of the community of the larger society who are left behind so non-governmental organizations, civic organizations, faith-based organizations, okay, uh, local traditional organizations, businesses, non-profits, and the government need to work together, including with international agencies, when it comes specifically to these global challenges that we are experiencing. For example, the pandemic we are currently in and climate hazard um, uh, events as well that are oncoming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Njoki. Um, I've been informed that uh, we have the poll results uh, sent to you via email, and we are going to give you a few minutes to go through that. But just as you close uh, the, in, on the issue of um, of the role of the government. Indeed, we observed the government take on the responsibility of managing this health pandemic. And we also saw the government mobilizing partners, including from the private sector, to really get the much needed funding and other relief arrangements. That is just to underscore the fact that disaster resilience or looking at disasters needs to have that all of society approach so we are going to give dr njoki two minutes to uh, to um, to put together or to collate the outcome of the poll and in the meantime we thank you very much for actually um, taking time to participate in the poll. It is going to inform uh, future learning programs going forward with IIA and its partners, and in this particular case, with the Strathmore University. Thank you, Mugani. We have um, one question. Please go ahead. Okay. Dr. Njoki, I feel that most of our politicians went quiet when we were faced with so many problems as SMEs. How can we resolve this moving forward? 
uh, thank you for the question again, and I, and, and I do appreciate the continued engagement. I would like to pause it here that it's not just the politicians that went quiet. I think quite a significant number of people went quiet because of what has been referenced to as an unprecedented event, right? It is something that people talk about in shock because they didn't necessarily have it front and center as a possibility. And that is the role that um, we would like to broaden so that we enable politicians, community members, and other leaders as well to understand, like I said earlier, that disasters are real. They are here to stay. We have survived them historically. We are here today and looking forward, we will continue to experience them. And some of them will be very compounded, okay? So politicians may have gone quiet for multiple reasons. And I certainly uh, would like to, to, to get a sense to which um, you know, they were aware. But when you listen to somebody like Honorable Shebesh, who was here earlier, you get a sense that, yes, there has been these conversations have been happening, but then maybe the attention has not been focused. Why? The reason is disasters such as the one we currently are in is a very low probability but high impact event. What do I mean by that? The chances of a major pandemic, major earthquake, major tsunami, major locust invasion, major flooding, major climate events, right? People either tend to not think about it because it seems too far and the resources that are being competed for are, you know, there's, there's one pot, okay? So people either, even if they have a sense that it might happen, choose not to prioritize it because they do not understand, like I said earlier, that for every dollar you invest in mitigation, which is planning and anticipating these events, you're saving seven, eight and above on the back end. But there's also a sense to which um, disasters are, it just seem scary and, and, and unmanageable, right? People do not quite necessarily have the knowledge, which is what we are trying to generate now, or the understanding that disasters have been studied disasters are being studied and disasters, yes, can be projected with some degree of precision, but then there are some that are going to surprise us. And that's what we want. We want to be prepared and to be surprised, not shocked into silence when they happen. And like someone else referenced having a toolbox, whenever they do happen, because they will happen, we need to have our toolbox ready and to remove the toolkit and remove the directions that we have to understand, okay, here's a disaster, how do we handle it? But here's a word of caution. There's no disaster that looks like the other. Even if it's a pandemic, the next time we are in a pandemic, because we will be in one, the context will be very different. So you cannot apply 100% of the same toolkit that you have and applied for responding to this pandemic the way you will in the future one so you need to have some flexibility for innovation creation networking and leveraging of your networks i will leave it there but i hope i have addressed that uh, question thank you so much dr njoki and and indeed it is uh, it has touched on uh, on key key uh, pointers that uh, that I am certain have responded or have given feedback to uh, to our participant. I am hesitating because I want us to see how we are doing on time. And if you just give me one um, one uh, quick minute, we have one last question, which I think we, we really must take this one. Sorry, Wangeshi and team, just so that uh, we, we can really thrash out uh, these questions we have taken time to be here in the in the three series this is the last of it so we take advantage of that dr njoki is over to you again <laughs> and we the question is uh do we have examples of disaster and emergency preparedness where a bottom-up approach has worked well and our participant says that i feel disaster management ends in policy papers in kenya and the community are always clue 
less? Very good question. Over to you, Dr. Njoki. I tell you what, that is a profoundly uh, well situated question. Actually, we did have a speaker who referenced that same reality. The policy, I think it was Honorable Shebesh, the policy papers, the research papers that we, we, are, we are so heavily engaged in, all exist somewhere on a shelf collecting dust. For the most part, not 100%, but for the most part, we will talk about it. We will actually have these meetings, develop these, these uh, frameworks. And then when it comes to the next step of implementation, there is a shortfall. That is why I am very, very, very um, enthusiastic about the role of Strathmore, IIA, and our partners today and not just today, but going forward. Because what we are saying here today is that we are beginning to take these steps that we were challenged earlier too by, by Honorable Shebesh and by Wangeshi, right? To actually put feet to the work, to the plans that are collecting dust on a shelf. So yes, you are right that a lot of these realities you know the implementation the practices the actual operationalization right of these plans is very minimal but let me not that uh, it is of comfort but this does not just happen in kenya when you look at disaster research even in leading countries right you find that that tends to be the, the, the weakness right which is in the the implementation of disaster planning for the same reasons that I stated earlier, it seems so out there, so 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 removed. What are the chances we will get a pandemic? The other thing that uh, I have also realized, and and literature also research literature also bears this out, is that we have really been measuring and depending on metrics of measurement, right? That in some instances for example in this pandemic have not reflected the reality to which countries and communities are prepared what do i mean real quick i will say that in 2019 the johns hopkins uh, university here in the u.s a leading uh, public health um, um, institution came up with a global index measuring the degree to which countries are prepared to deal with, which is respond to and recover from, okay, uh, pandemics. In, in, oh, and of course, they work in concert with the World Health Organization. The leading countries that were indicated for having a very strong, very robust pandemic preparedness uh, plan and implementation policies was the U.S., and you all know what has happened in the US. There are variables that were not included in this Johns Hopkins measure that actually almost fully upended the way in which the pandemic response plan was initiated and carried out in the US. Yet we have seen other countries that have leaders who understand the science public health right do a phenomenal job small countries do a phenomenal job of trying to operationalize pandemic response they are on the african continent we have seen them in Asia, in countries like new zealand and australia as well so i hope i have touched on your uh, response uh, uh, sorry on your question Thank you so much, Dr. Njoki. Now, be, without further ado, we now hand back to Dr. Njoki to move forward with the outcome of the, fo of the poll, excuse me, before we move on to the closing segment. Over to you, Dr. Njoki. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. I will admit I have not had uh, 
a lot of time, of course, uh, to look at the at the response. But I do want to thank the team at IIA that has been working to put to put together uh, the poll responses. And thank you all also for for participating. So uh, when I will select a few a few questions to address. The first question was: uh, To what extent has COVID negatively impacted or disrupted your business? To no surprise, um, significantly and severely are the leading categories by 70 percent so 70 percent of us need to learn from the 30 percent that is either just barely making it or is really doing well so we need to develop the social capital the networks with our fellow sme leaders to understand what was it and of course understand that when it comes to listening and networking with each other by developing cooperative um uh, uh, knowledge and, and, and practices is that your business is going to be very unique. But when it comes to disasters, there are some key areas th that are called all had the all hazards approach. There are some key areas which are consistently a challenge in disasters. So essentially, you identify those and communication and technology is one of them. Okay, misinformation and uh, is, is also another that we are currently seeing. Okay, resourcing is another. So you identify the areas of similarity, figure out and learn how it is that others, other SMEs have done it. And then from there, go home or to your office, take that uh, template and then fill in the areas in that are relevant to your business. So 100% of the responders are of value here because those that are severely and significantly affected can learn from those that are either still going strong and moderately making it. But to be honest, uh, nobody is in the category of slightly or not at all affected. Most people are moderately, very heavily, significantly affected and severely impacted. The other question that I would like to touch on was whether COVID-19 has made possible uh, positive outcomes. Here's what we need to understand. And I cannot say it any better than the SME interviewees. They have realigned their businesses, restructured, stepped back, thought they were going to fail, but kept moving using different strategies, production changes, different manufacturing processes, uh, uh, scheduling your employees to work day and night shifts, delivering door to door, shutting down temporarily, rethinking, talking straight to business people, reorganizing how you do your payments, talking to vendors. The information is out there. This was just an introduction and, 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 a, and a very tight summary of what is available. We have also seen panelists and other members, Honorable Shabesh, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Nyamu, they, and, and Kyle as well, who have said, come to us, this is the kind of information that we have, right? And these are the kinds of tools that we can support you with. So this is a learning opportunity because remember, disasters will happen. And disasters are not do not happen in nice, neat little boxes where they say, oh, let's wait for the pandemic to end. No, we see a confluencing and cascading outcome where the impact has been um, ongoing and one disaster comes on top of another, etc. Okay. Do you have adequate knowledge uh, is another question about protecting your business from cybersecurity. This is the place to be. Majority of the people say uh, yes. That is 53% said yes. My question is for the 47% who say no, I do hope that you can take up the offer that has been made here with in, in, in uh, collaboration with our partners to offer an opportunity to actually come and learn about that. Uh, cyber security. And for, the, for those of you who said yes, I wonder what your response would be now after listening to one of our panelists who broke down what it is you have to do, beginning with a risk analysis, right, um, to, to actually be prepared for uh, malware, da data breaches, etc. This one is important. Does your business have a business pl a plan for disasters? My, uh, again, 47% said yes, 
53 said no. But then the next question is really important. How often do you review the plan? 59% said, percent said they do at least once a year. My question is, what does your review look like? Is it a meeting where you sit and just look through the paperwork and say, yes, we have this. Yes, we have this. No, we don't have this. Or do you actually do functional, practical exercises to try and really play out the scenarios of a disaster happening, impacting your community, your, your, your uh, business, and actually seeing what that outcome really, really would be? Are you testing your plans? Not just reviewing, are you testing your plans? Are your employers and employees are, are aware of their role as stipulated in, in the disaster plan? Again, this is something that was reiterated by my fellow panelists. 53% said yes, 47% said no. Again, the dialogue does need to happen because again, this is an all of society approach. This requires that you have non-business-like conversations with your employees with your vendors, for example, with your employees, you would probably need to ask them if you got sick or if your family member got sick in a pandemic, if you're planning for a pandemic, would you be able to work from home? Do you have the facilities to work from home? Or if you're an, you're an employee that needs to be in the office, would you have support? Would you be able to, off, to organize for support for your family member so that you can still come to work? Or can you work, can you safely work at night? What can we as an organization do maybe to support your transport, your safe transportation from your place where you live to the office so that you can do the work that you need to do? So the conversation needs to be expanded beyond just official to in, to understand that as Kyle said it's about people and the and one of the great the greatest resource that an SME has are its people beginning with your employees would you say that climate change uh, I'm jumping uh, the questions quite a bit because of time would you say that climate change disaster events are currently affecting your business 60 percent of the people said yes that is very, very encouraging because that the truth is we're not waiting for climate change to happen. It is happening now. 40% said no. And I, I dare to venture that they said no because maybe they're not keenly aware to know how it is that it is impacting your business. Okay, so this is an area in which that if you if you think it is not affecting it now, it's some it's a good time for you to actually sit down and make very robust plans for when it does impact your, your business because it will. I think I will stop there in the interest of time and thank you once again for participating in this poll and also say that on the poll that we did um, in, in dialogue two, th th there's quite some alignment, right, in, in the responses that you have uh, uh, given us with the responses that we had last time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Njoki. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today's dialogue has been truly enriching. Um, we have uh, gone beyond our time, but we do appreciate that despite all this, we know that the panelists have once again highlighted the fact that disaster risk management needs to be based on an understanding of disaster risk in all its dimensions of vulnerability, capacity, exposure of persons and assets, hazards, and the environment. We all have a role to play in safeguarding lives and livelihoods. I would like now, I would now like to invite uh, Ms. Wangeshi Muriyoki for the final, final part of our program. Over to you, Wangeshi. All right. So thank you very, very much, Mothoni, to the panelists, to the uh, participants, to the SMEs and everyone else who is joining. We know that our time is really far gone, but we thank you for staying on and uh, keeping this really enriching and engaging. I just want to highlight what our next steps will be after this, because we are concluding on our dialogue series and um, just shed some light on uh, where we are going on the second phase and the third phase before I invite my colleague Terry to move a vote of thanks. So 
We have conducted three dialogue series, as uh, mentioned earlier in my opening remarks. And what's going to happen now is that we are kicking on to our second phase, which is on planning and implementing post-dialogue recommendations. We do recognize that we've had a number of you joining uh, in and out of, uh, from the first session, and you may be wondering, so what happens after this? So we are going to um, be working together with our partners and collaborators, including other stakeholders, to document the recommendations and the findings of the three dialogue series so that we first of all have a document and we have you know put together every piece of information that is important as we mentioned our priority is to develop this um, framework so what we are going to do as partners is to is to sit together and uh, build that consensus in terms of uh, the development of the roadmap for policy policy action towards this um, um, MSME uh, risk resilience framework. And we hope to also come up with a medium term strategy and a program that Dr. Njoki has outlined. We want to roll out a program that should be running and will be implemented by Strathmore University by the second quarter, by the mid-second quarter, and, and um, I recognize that the first quarter is ending today. And the other thing that we will be doing is to engage stakeholders and build that commitment and call to action, both by the public and the private sector, to commit to risk-informed investments. As you heard, Honorable Rachel is very vocal and passionate about supporting us to drive this conversation down to the counties and the third thing is that we will be mobilizing resources to enable us in implementing this strategy so we are working on a tight program between april and june to have concluded with the second phase and getting into the implementation so the issue of the program design or the program is so fundamental right now because as as, as we can uh, as you can see we need to empower smes and we'll be mobilizing resources to ensure that smes can be able to access um, that program so um, as we we make progress we will be you know, uh, communicating um, where we are, the status of our actions, and we will be convening again at the right time. So without further ado, I would like to invite Terry, who is uh, Invest in Africa's uh, Chief Operations Officer, to move about things. Thank you very much, Wangeshi, and um, indeed, I'm very pleased to move the vote of thanks today. As um, Ongesha has indicated, I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Invest in Africa Kenya. So on behalf of Invest in Africa, the event partners and the Disaster Risk Dialogue Series Organizing Committee, I want to just extend a big thank you first and foremost to the speakers of the day for very insightful contributions. You will agree with me that the dialogue today will not have been complete without any of them. And I must also mention my appreciation to Her Excellency the Nairobi City Governor, uh, City Council Deputy Governor and Acting Governor Anne Kanani for gracing the, the masterclass, although she unfortunately we did not get to hear from her. So, Madam Kanani, thank you very much. Our deep gratitude goes to our keynote speaker of the day, Honorable Rachel Shebesh, um, who is the Chief Administrative Secretary for the Ministry of Public Service and Gender. She's also the Champion for Disaster Risk Reduction for the UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. And it was very clear to see why her passion, her experience was very inspiring. We are grateful for your insights on the practical way forward on Shibesh, and for your commitment in partnering with Invest in Africa and all partners to champion SME resilience. Thank you very much. We'd also like to extend our thanks to SMEs who were featured in our SME Voice video for sharing your resilient stories so generously, so authentically, uh, just bringing your voice to the dialogue. You have inspired us with uh, what you have managed to do to keep up float. Mary Ngechu, Jimmy Malu, Alex Nsembi, and Bernadette Kanja. Thank you. We are grateful to our four panelists this afternoon for their very enriching insights, 
in shifting our mindsets from plans to action. They have given us reasonable starting points for those who are looking for a beginning. They have helped to build our knowledge for those who are already involved and have attended previous a series and offered us various solutions. So Mr. Julius Kabubi, Mr. Robert Nyamu, Mr. Kyle Newell, and Dr. Njoki Marumba, a big appreciation uh, from us. We are indebted to our moderator for the day, Mugali Njogu. Thank you for moderating exceptionally this afternoon and for your commitment, your consistency in organizing and delivering all three dialogue series from October last year. And we're excited that we'll be moving forward in the next steps with, um, you know, with you because your experience and your passion is invaluable and greatly appreciated. Thank you very much, Madam Angel. We'd like to thank the event partners. Invest in Africa is really grateful for your collaboration and partnership as we drive SME resilience, particularly for disaster risk. We greatly appreciate the shared experiences our shared commitment towards building a culture of risk management and of course supporting SMEs to build uh, resilience, especially during the ongoing efforts towards recovery and building back better. So our gratitude goes to the Ministry of Public Service and Gender, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, to Mastercard Foundation and to our official media partner who has been airing this session live, Metropole TV. Thank you to you all. To our partners, to our participants, sorry, we are so grateful and honored that you joined the dialogue today. You're actually the ones working the talk of SME resilience against disaster risk. And right now we know that COVID-19 is just one of the many disasters that we face. And as Honorable Shebesh has said, it will take all of us together to build enterprises that can withstand any disaster. So we welcome you to stay joined to us. Let's keep the conversation going. And more importantly, let us join our hands in action beyond today. Our gratitude also goes to the organizing committee. It's often said that when you want to go fast, you go alone. And when you want to go far, you work with our fantastic and a greatly committed organizing committee to deliver such a seamless session today. And we thank you. And at this point, I really hope I have not inadvertently left anyone out. But please, may you all feel very appreciated and know that it takes each one of us to have these important dialogues going. Each one of your contributions is invaluable and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts.